Hello everybody and welcome to today's video where we're going to be talking all about right groups in Unity's Entity Component System. No, not left groups, wrong groups, or even read groups, but in fact we're going to be talking about right groups. So right groups are a cool feature part of Unity ECS that allow us to do some pretty neat things with a common ECS development pattern. They're also really important to understand because Unity does use them a fair bit internally, which means that if we don't know exactly what we're doing and how to use them, we can end up in some pretty weird situations where things just are not working how we think that they should be. And it's going to be really hard to track these issues down if you don't know what's going on. So of course, in today's video, I'm going to be talking about what exactly right groups are, when to use them, how Unity uses them, and how you can use them in your own project in the tutorial section of this video. And as per usual with these tutorial videos, I will leave links to all the code and project files down in the description below. I am changing up the way that I actually share these project files with you so instead in the past I've kind of just shared like a um, exported package of the project files so now I'm actually sending you basically like the full project files uh, minus like the library folder and all that stuff so it'll just you know rebuild when your project opens up the first time but I think this is going to be a much more reliable method of sharing project files with you all so I would highly encourage you to download these project files play around with them yourself make sure you understand actually how these right groups work so you can really take full advantage of them in your own Unity ECS projects. Anyways, if today's video helps you out, really appreciate it if you hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, comment below, you know what to do. Let's get into it. All right, so before we get into the actual definition of what a right group is, I think it's important for us to kind of understand these situations where we might want to use them. So a common pattern of an entity component system model is where we take in some components as inputs and then we write to another separate component as output. So now a right group will say target that output component. Now, if an entity contains an object that is part of that right group, then we can essentially override that system System that is taking in that input and writing to that specific output component and actually use a different system which allows us to use you know a completely different implementation of everything in order to write to a specific component so this is useful in a couple different scenarios in the tutorial section of the video I'm going to be showing you how we can basically make a power-up system where you know given different power-ups maybe through a tag or a data component we can actually have a completely different system run that allows the game to function differently. Now, of course, we can create something like this with entity queries. You know, we can say, you know, oh, let's just go ahead and ignore all entities with this specific tag. Well, the benefit of right groups is we don't have to worry about the specific tags. In fact, we can have any number of these power ups and we don't actually have to account for all those in the original system. So these right groups are also helpful if we're dealing with some maybe external packages where we don't have the ability to actually modify the source of them, but we still want to override the implementation of what they're doing. So now the actual definition of like what a right group is. So a, a right group is going to consist of all the components types that have the right group attribute targeting a one specific component type. So let's say, for example, we have a number of data components that when they're added to an entity, we want to override the way in which these entities write to a transform component. So that means on all these specific data entities, we can just go ahead and add the right group attribute passing in the type of translation, which will add all those components to the right group. So that's basically the right group is all the components that are targeting that one single component. And we can have any number of components added to this right group that we want. So let me give you a quick example, just so you can kind of understand how these work a little bit better. So let's say we have a system that takes all entities that have a specific move speed component. It's going to take that in as input, and then it's going to write the output to the translation component. So our entity can basically just move in a straight line. Now let's say that we want to change this behavior up a little bit. And if we say, you know, give a specific tag to an entity, it's going to move in a zigzag pattern rather than just a straight line. Well, we can basically create this zigzag tag component and then we'll add the right group attribute passing in the type of translation which basically adds that tag component to the translation right group and then now we can essentially override the implementation of writing to that translation component where instead of just writing in a direct straight line we're actually going to be calculating a zigzag pattern 
and writing the necessary data to the translation component. Now, again, this is really beneficial because we can have any unknown number of these tags and data components added to this write group. So we can have all different types of implementations of different movement types that write to this particular translation component. So essentially write groups just allow us to have one system that takes precedence over another system. And again, we don't need to worry about modifying that initial system at all. So we don't need to account for any new random number of data tags that we might create later on in development. So one way to think about how these write groups works is it basically takes our standard entity query for a system. And if our system does have write groups enabled, then it's basically just going to add all those components that are part of the write group as part of the, you know, with none property. So essentially our queries are going to ignore anything that's going to have those components that are part of that write group. Now, I should just point out that if we do have the, uh, you know, with all or with any tags as part of our entity query, it's basically going to, you know, ignore and take precedence over our write group. So that's just something to be aware. You know, if you are getting a little bit more complex with your entity queries, you know, make sure that you are accounting for any write groups properly. And so, yeah, basically given the set of input components that we want, again, we can override the implementation of how we write to a specific component and we can write to that component in another way, or we can just even write to a completely different output component if that's what our system does. So like I mentioned, this isn't just going to ignore our initial system by default. We actually do have to do one thing on the initial system so it can basically support write groups. So there is an entity query option if you're doing an entities.foreach function. Uh, you can just do a dot with entity query options, passing in entity query options dot filter write group. Um, also, if you're doing an entity query in the traditional sense, there is a way that you can enable that same entity query option. So without this specific option, even if you do have write groups set up properly, otherwise your system isn't going to ignore anything with components of that particular write group. Also, another very important point to point out is in your initial system, that specific component that you're targeting for the write group that must be open for write access. It can't be set up for read only access using like the in keyword. It does need to be open for write access using the ref keyword, hence the name write groups. If that target component is set up for read only access in that initial system, that initial system is still going to run. So really the point of these is for when we are writing to a specific output component. All right, so to help you understand this a little bit better, let me show you a few examples about how these write groups actually work in practice. Now I'm actually gonna start by showing you a issue that you can run into if you're not using write groups carefully. Remember at the beginning of the video, I did mention that Unity does use these write groups internally. So if we're not careful, we can kind of end up in some weird situations. So basically I have this little scene here where if we hit the play button, you'll see that the green cube begins to rise here and the red cube just stays stationary. Now, if we actually go ahead and look at these cubes, you see that we have the go cube, which is the green cube. This just has a move tag on it. And then on the stop cube, we have a move tag and a stop tag. Now you may be thinking, oh, you're probably just filtering out for the stop tag in your system. Well, that is not actually the case. This is the entire system that I have running here. Um, so we're just looking at entities with all, everything with a move tag, which both the cubes have a move tag. And of course, everything with a translation component, which both of them do. And you'll see that we're just going to basically increment the Y value by our delta time every single frame. So now at first glance of the system, you would say, you know, both these cubes should rise, but they're not. So uh, let's take a closer look at the stop tag here. You'll see that on the stop tag, you'll see that I've added it to the write group for local to world. That means that any system that's going to write to the local to world component is actually not going to update. Now, if you watch my video about translations in Unity ECS, you know that the local to world component, that's actually the end all be all about where uh, actually that entity lives in the world. So I'll show you something kind of interesting that's happening here. So if we look at the go cube, you'll see that the translation component is continually incrementing in the Y value. And also you'll see that the local to world component is going to be updating every single frame as well. Now, if we look at the stop cube, you'll see that the translation component on the stop cube continues to update every single frame. However, the local to world component is not actually being updated. So even though we're modifying the translation component directly, 
that local to world component is not being updated and thus the red cube is not moving at all. The reason that this happens is because that system that actually takes the translation, rotation, and scale values and writes them to the local to world component, that system does have the right group filters enabled. Now, I've added in just a simple little thing here where if I press the R key, it actually removes that stop um, tag component and you'll see that um, immediately the local to world component gets updated with what the translations value is and it just continues to rise off the screen as normal now i did just want to point that out because there was someone over in our discord community who i guess ran into some issues um, basically doing this kind of similar thing where they were writing to the translation component and you know the entity was just not moving and that's because i guess they were doing some things where they had a component on that entity that was part of the local to world right group so that is something to you know absolutely be aware of and if you do want to get really deep into the unity ecs source code definitely go check out the translation stuff because they do use right groups a fair bit in there so that would be a good kind of example use case about how they're used in practice so let's go ahead and play with a fun little example project here you'll see that basically um, i've set up this little project where we have this kind of like cannon looking thing and it's just going to you know shoot these shots every time you hit the space key um, however we can actually add power-ups so uh, you know you see that this is going about this speed and then if we press the two key it's actually going to shoot them out at double speed so they're going to be moving a lot faster now if we press the number three key it's going to do a wide triple shot it's going to spread it's going to shoot you know three shots kind of in a wide direction and if we press the number four it's just going to go ahead and um, actually shoot four of these a little bit more narrowly so these are kind of, you know, four different power ups that we can kind of just like cycle between. You'll see that um, basically I'm just kind of adding and removing tags that are of a particular right group in order to accomplish these essentially power ups here. So here's what I'm going to be showing you now. And once again, I do have all the code and project files featured in today's video available using the links down in the description below. Once again, I would highly recommend that you go ahead and download those, actually play around with these, pick apart the projects, understand how that they work because that's going to be really helpful for you to actually understand how these right groups work. I know this is actually kind of like a little bit more of an intermediate topic. So I think this is something that you really do need to get hands on with. So I would highly recommend that you download those project files. So you see on the Canon controller, we just have a couple data components here. We have one for the shot prefab. It's just going to keep track of the shot prefab so it knows uh, which one to spawn. We also have the fire key, which we've just set to the space bar. So it's basically going to take in these uh, inputs of when the fire key is pressed as well as the shot prefab. And then we're actually going to write to the spawn shot data as an output component. So the way that this works is when we press the space bar, it's essentially going to populate the spawn shot data with some specific values. And then we have another system that basically takes in the spawn shot data as input. And based off of that input, it's going to spawn the necessary shots into the world. And then that's how we can actually get this behavior. You know, if you're actually implementing in this project, you know, maybe there are a couple different ways that you can do that. But again, the idea is that we want to have a specific component that we are writing to, which will be overridden by different systems. So that's basically what I've done here is I have this spawn shot data as a target for our write groups, which is, you know, a component type that we're going to be writing to in a couple of different ways. So for starters, let's just take a look at the two component types that we have that are part of this write group. So you'll see that we've created this double shot speed tag. It's just an empty data component. And you'll see that we have the attribute for uh, write group passing in type of spawn shot data. Again, we're going to be targeting the spawn shot data component as our write group type. And so that's basically all we need to do to get that set up. Same thing with our spread shot data. You know, we can do something a little bit more interesting than just tags where we can actually, you know, have some values um, for, you know, the number of shots and the angle of shots. And so again, we're just adding the attribute for the right group type of spawn shot data. Okay, so now let's actually get into the different systems at play here. So here we have the regular shot system. This is basically just going to be the default behavior. You know, if we don't have any of these power up tags enabled, it's basically, you know, what's going to happen when we press the space key and how we spawn these shot prefabs. So you see that our entities.forreach function, again, we do just need to enable right group filtering. 
uh, by doing just this dot with entity query options, passing in entity query options dot filter right group. So if we didn't have this, our initial system would still run. It would never actually be overridden. Now you see in our for each function, we're going to be writing to the spawn shot data. And again, we are taking input from the shot prefab so we know which actual shot to spawn as a prefab. And then we're also going to take in input in from the fire key. So you see that, um, you know, we'll just check to see if the fire key has been pressed down. By the way, I've just set up a little property on the data component so we can easily get that nice and cleanly. Then you see all we're going to do is we're just going to write to the spawn shot data, which is already part of that Canon controller uh, entity. And you'll see that we're just going to go ahead and populate these different values. So we'll say the, you know, shot prefab is equal to the shot prefab. We're gonna, uh, you know, get the velocity and the number of shots to spawn and what the uh, shot spread angle is. So you see, this is just kind of the default behavior. We're just spawning one of them at a regular speed and we're not having any kind of like angle spread to it. So then I'm not actually gonna go through how all this works, but I do have this other spawn shot system that's going to take in input from this uh, spawn shot data here. And then basically based off of the data that's input in there, it's gonna spawn the correct number of shots. And then finally at the end, it's just going to reset the spawn shot data so it doesn't you know continually spawn new shots every single frame. So again, we can come back here. Basically all we're doing right now is just spawning that one single initial shot every time that we press the spawn Space bar. All right, now then we can move over to one of the systems that we're using to override that initial system. So you'll see that this is the double speed system. So again, we're just looking for everything that has this double shot speed tag. So you see, we're not doing anything like extra on this system. We don't have to like enable right group filtering or anything like that. It's basically just as easy as writing a regular system. And you'll see that in this case, there's only a real slight difference of how we're um, actually implementing these shots. It's basically just when we get our shot velocity, we're gonna go ahead and look at the current velocity and just go ahead and multiply that by two. Otherwise, the implementation is basically identical to the original one, um, but we do just have to put, of course, that full implementation there. So now when we come over here, again, of course, we can still fire those regular shots and then we enable the double shot speed you'll see that the shots now move at double speed across the map. And then finally, we do just have one system for the spread shot system. You see that this one is going to take in input from a couple more places. So uh, not only is it going to take in input from, of course, the fire key and the shot prefab, but it's also looking at the spread shot data. And basically in the system that I have that, um, you know, adds the specific data components to that Canon controller entity when we press, you know, the number one, two, three, and four keys, it's actually going to add this specific spread shot data component to that entity um, with different values. So for example, it's when we press the number three key, we're just gonna go ahead and add the spread shot data components, passing in that we want to spawn three shots at a wide angle of 90 degrees. And then when I press the four key, we're still going to add a spread shot data component but this time the values of that data component are a little bit different. We're instead going to be spawning four shots, I believe at a 20 degree angle. And then you'll see here again, in this case, the implementation is pretty similar to the original system. Of course, we're just gonna go ahead and set the shot prefab and its regular velocity. This time, the number of shots to spawn, instead of just spawning one shot, we're actually going to um, spawn the number of shots defined in the spread shot data. And same thing with the angle, we're actually going to you know, define the angle in that data component and add it to the spawn shot data. So again, basically all that allows us to do is now when we press the number three key, we can spawn three shots. And if we press four, it's gonna allow us to spawn four shots. So anyways, that's kind of an overview about how right groups work in Unity's entity component system. I know this is probably a little bit more of an intermediate topic and we were kind of get into the weeds on some things. So you know, totally understand if you didn't fully understand everything here. Again, I would highly recommend that you go ahead and download these project files, play around with them for a little bit, just go ahead and kind of pick them apart. Again, if you are you know, really interested in learning about more about what right groups do, would highly recommend also diving into the source code a little bit, checking out some of the things related to how the translation systems work, uh, because again, those do use right groups under the hood. So anyways, that's just about going to do it for today's video. Really do hope that you enjoyed it and you learned something about right groups. If you did find this video helpful, I really appreciate it if you hit that like button. Also, feel free to subscribe to the channel for lots more videos about Unity's entity component system and their data oriented technology stack. 
course, if you do have any questions for me or suggestions for future videos, feel free to leave those down in the comment section below or join us over on Discord over at tmg.dev discord. Hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day. I'll see you in the next one.